I know it's coming. I know it's coming. It's just even at the door. I can tell. You just kind of look at the signs of the times. You read the headlines. You know that some bad times are coming around the corner. Uh, It is open season on preachers. I'm not kidding you. It is open season on preachers. Uh, This just in from CNS News. Price of chicken reaches all-time high in U.S. Price for fresh whole chickens hits its all-time high in the United States in October, according to data released last week by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. January 1980, when the BLS, I've had some of those sandwiches, they're really good, uh, started tracking the price of its commodity. Fresh whole chickens were 69 cents a pound by this October 2003. Um Fresh whole chickens cost $1.54 a pound. In the last decade alone, the price has gone up 51% from a buck two to its current price of a buck 54 per pound. I'm telling you, it's open season. They're trying to eliminate the preachers by jacking up the price of fried chicken. When I was ordained to be a minister of the gospel, they asked me two questions. Preacher Hoggard. Will you hate sin and love chicken? I said, I'm your guy right here. This is Pastor Mike, and I am online, and I am live coming to you from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52, just outside of Berryville, Ark- or excuse me, this is how they say it down here, Burville. Uh, where are you from? I'm old, from old Bur- Burville. Burville, Arkansas. Good to be with you today. I'm going to talk about our country, the shape that it's in. Didn't used to be that way. We didn't used to be in bad shape here in this country. Uh, Let's see here. What am I reading here? You know, I threw away the first page of this particular article. There is, hang on a second. It's about the Supreme Court. Hang on. What happened to it? Anyway. The Supreme Court is taking up the health care law once again. This time, it is dealing with, uh, let's see, Hobby Lobby. The Obama health care rule, law, dictatorship. And uh, I, made a, I made a statement Sunday morning. Um. I don't like being mean like this. I don't I don't like saying stuff like this, like I won't do a certain thing, and then people are asking me, Well, if I do it, is that am I going to hell or am I gonna is that the mark of the beast or what? I, I so I, you know, I I try to be a little bit careful in it, but I made a statement Sunday morning during the service that I just I have this feeling. I think it's based upon facts. By the way, there's an article on Drudge Report. Uh, today that uh, somebody's reporting on Newsmax, one of the professionals involved in the Obamacare legislation said, yep, there's death panels in that law, uh, to which all the Democrats and everybody else is vehemently denying. There are, in fact, death panels. What does that mean? It means that when once everybody is under the government health dictatorship, a panel will decide if you are of a certain age, let's say 60, 65 years old, if you're of that certain age and you end up with cancer, something like that, heart problems, the death panel will weigh the cost of, of keeping you alive versus um, what benefit it would bring to you. And so if you end up with cancer or, let's say, heart disease or something like that, and it's going to cost, in their esteemed uh, mind, if it's going to cost $65,000 to give you treatments and keep you alive, 
if it's going to cost that. And they think, well, you know, they're 65. You know, that's just, boy, I don't know. You know, I know that realistically they've only got maybe 40 more years left. So they may not, you may not get the treatment that you want to get. Now, they're going to be nice to you. They're going to send you a package of uh, morphine to endure the pain while you die slowly. But anyway, and that's in there. And I made the statement Sunday morning that I think the Obama dictatorship of health care is a trap. I think it's a trap. Um, I think it is designed to lure people in under the guise that they're going to have free health care. They'll be able to go to the doctor, won't have to pay for it. They can have as many kids as they want. Government will pay for it. Have as many abortions as they want. Government will pay for it. Get free drugs. Government will pay for it. I think it's meant, I think it's designed as a very, very clever trap. And I won't sign up for it. I won't do it. Now, if you sign up, I'm telling you, it's not the mark of the beast. It's not. But in my opinion, it could very well lead to that. And so if you happen to have already signed up for Obamacare or you are contemplating it, don't worry about little old me telling you that you shouldn't do it. Don't don't worry about that. Uh, see, I, I try to be nice to everybody, and, I, and I'm being serious. There will come a time, people, this is Scripture. There will come a time when I believe you and I, who believe the Scriptures exactly as they are written, are going to have to take a stand for what we believe in and what we won't bow down to and what we won't cave into I believe that we're going to have to stand on what God tells us to do, even at the expense of our own life. That's, that's what we are appointed unto, the Bible says. Uh, but anyway, there is, a, um, there is an argument going on right now, Supreme Court, weighing the issue of Hobby Lobby, the, and Hobby Lobby is, I think, is run by a Catholic family. And you say, yeah, I don't, I don't care what they do. They're Catholic. Not so fast. Because if the Obama health dictatorship has the right and has the ability to force the Hobby Lobby company to prescribe or pay for um, what is it, birth control or abortion, if the government can make Hobby Lobby pay for that, which is against Catholic dogma, then that sets a precedent whereby you will, in the future, not be able to opt out of something based upon a religious preference. Many of you do not do uh, immunizations. Knock yourself out. Uh, and there is or has been in the state of Missouri a little, a little waiver you fill out. I am, this is against my religious principles and I won't do it. You fill that out and you don't. But we can see the tide turning. We can see where the school districts, the state governments, the state health departments, then it's going to get into the federal government where you won't be able to waiver that anymore. You won't be able to opt out of it. And you have to decide where is my religious stand? Where is, the, where is it that I can show in the Bible? This is, why, this is why I tell you, read the scriptures, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Um. And I haven't really 
done all of the research into vaccines, immunizations, things like that. You've heard me tell that before we went to Kenya, I had to go get shot up. Um, And so far, I'm fine. Um, You're going to have to you're going to have to prove, according to Scripture, what you believe. David, um, David, uh, can't think of his name. David Gibbs, Christian Law Association, loves the King James Bible. And um, he says, if you go into court, you're going to prove something. Better take a King James with you. Guy's a smart man. But anyway, you say, well, they're Hobby Lobby's Roman Catholic. I hope it. I hope the Obama government sticks it to them. If the government is allowed to set a precedent that says that the government can force you against your religious objectives or objections, can force you into certain things that is for, in the government eyes, for your benefit, where does that line stop? Then the government, and we know, we know that once you get the camel's nose under the tent, the camel's coming in, which you shouldn't smoke those things to begin with. Once the camel's nose is under there, he's coming in. And so it'll, it will be, we'll, we'll end up just like China, where after you have your first child, they're going to cut up the second one in an abortion mill. State run dictatorship of killing innocent babies for simply being conceived. That is what's coming to America. This is why this stuff is so dangerous. It's a trap, people. And we're going to see what goes on with that. Spies worry over doomsday cash, C-A-C-H-E, cache. Pardon my French. Stashed by ex-NSA contractor Snowden. British and U.S. intelligence officials say they're worried about a doomsday cache of highly classified, heavily encrypted material they believe former national security agent contractor Edward Snowden has stored on a data cloud. The cache contains documents generated by the NSA and other agencies and includes names of the U.S. and allied intelligence personnel, seven current and former U.S. officials, and other sources briefed on the matter. The data is protected with sophisticated encryption and multiple passwords are needed to open it, said two of the sources who, like the others, spoke on condition of anonymity to discuss intelligence matters. The passwords are in the possession of at least three different people and are valid for only a brief time, brief window each day, they said. The identities of persons who might have the passwords are unknown. Spokespeople for both NSA and the U.S. Office of the Director of National uh, Unintelligence declined to comment. One source described the cache of still unpublished material as, quote, Snowden's insurance policy against arrest or physical harm. He's basically doing what, um, who was it, the... Uh, I don't know. They just made a movie about him. Uh, uh, what uh, WikiLeaks? Basically, that's what he did. Snowden encrypted a bunch of files, put them in a little packet. Probably has got them distributed in different places, and he's given certain people the email, uh, the uh, the passwords, and several passwords. One person would have this password, another person would have had that password. So if you you'd have to get to everybody in order to find out what the documents are. And it's basically, Snowden's basically saying, if anything happens to me, these people are instructed to open up this little Pandora's box here that you don't want opened up. Uh, Whether you think he's a traitor, some people do. And you know what? Technically, under the law, he may very well be. Or freedom fighter or anything like that. Uh, What the guy did was basically inform us, um, we're in trouble. We're in trouble in this nation, in this world. We are in tr- we are in big trouble. You've left your digital fingerprints all over the place. Your little digital DNA is everywhere on things that you did. Um, here is another story from CNN Tech. Embracing Big Brother, how facial recognition could help fight crime. And you know what? They don't need. They're te- they're teaching computers how to read facial expressions. And I'll tell you what. They ought to be married to Sweetie Pie. You don't need a computer to read Sweetie Pie's facial expressions. I'm just telling you, I don't need help from the government 
They understand what's going on behind those eyes. I can tell you that. She is a sweetie pie. I come in. I see her. She's smiling at me. Hi, darling. How you doing? Kiss, 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 kiss. I come in. She's got her eyes squinted a little bit. Oh, dear. You got a headache. Yeah. And then there's a face, and I don't know how to describe it, but it's just I'm going, hi, dear. I love you. Okay. Anyway, from fighting terrorism to processing payments in the blink of an eye, that is an interesting statement. The twinkling of an eye. Facial recognition is set to change our ideas on privacy. A number of ex exciting developments. Oh, this is so exciting. Developments in the field could even push its toughest critics to reconsider. The more people get out of it, the more they'll surrender to it, says Manolo Almagro, senior vice president of Digital for TPN Incorporated. Almagro believes that people will only embrace a technology if the benefits outweigh privacy concerns. And you know what? He's right. He's right. Um, when you have an Android device, like an Android phone uh, or a tablet. I have an Android phone and an Android tablet. And I've known this about Android for years. Before you install any of their, any of their packages, any of, uh, any of their apps, before you install them, Android will pop up with a little window showing you everything that that, 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 that app is going to have access to. Raise your hand if you scrutinize those little screens and go, you know what? I don't like that. I don't think it should have access to the. Why is it doing that? You know what? I'm not getting this. Raise your hand if anybody out there scrutinizes that little window and, and decides, you know what? I'm not letting that app do this. Any I, One, maybe two. We just go, ah, that's annoying. Click. And we download the software and install it on our government surveillance monitoring tracking devices. And so all these apps are running in the background on our phone or our tablet, getting a sniff of our GPS location, getting a, a, a sniff of what it is we're talking about, where we are, what we're doing, on and on and on and on and on, and everybody's embracing it. Come here. Come here, little Android. I love you. The more uh, the facial recognition is a computer-based system that automatically identifies a person based on a digital image or video source, which is then matched to information stored in a database. Often used in fictional TV series such as CSI, it is soon set to become a real-life tool for fighting crime. In 2014, if you watch a Person of Interest, they'll uh, they've been doing this ever since they started the show. And now I kind of get it. It's the machine that tracks everybody. And they'll show these clips of like a security camera and people walking down the sidewalk, a little square around them, and it's got a little name next to them, and the, the square is following their face. In other words, this computer is tracking everybody in the, in the country, in the world. It's doing that. You say, that's science fiction. They made that up for TV. Mm, yeah, I don't think so. Um. Facial recognition is a key part of the agency's ambitious 1 billion next generation identification system. Next, did you catch the phrase? Next generation identification. Next generation meaning there is coming a group of people who are going to have the next genes. They're going to have different DNA. That's what they're going to have. And they're going to be able, be able to be identified with that DNA. How did we get ourselves involved in this? That's what I'm getting to today. Here's a good one. This is from British Broadcasting Company. Child on child abuse, shocking. Children's Commissioner Report says. Um, shocking. Sexual violence is being carried out by children against other children as young as 11 years old, according to an official report. The Office of the Children's Commissioner for England said the perpetrators could be 12 or 13 
and rape is seen as, quote, normal and inevitable in some areas, especially among gangs. Its report said bullying and sexist attitudes existed across the country. Um, GB, Great Britain, or not so great Britain. How'd you guys get that way? How did that happen? Because you have to ask, well, that's Great Britain. That's not America, bless God. We still fly the flag. Want to bet? Want to bet? If you're an adult listening to me, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but in your mind, raise your hand. If you were approached by someone from any age group when you were a child, and that's, I'm going to just not just go on from there. This has been going on in America for years. And this same report could have very well come out of the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, Deputy Children's Commissioner Sue Berelowitz Berelowitz, cited the sheer levels of sadism uncovered by the inquiry. In a forward to the report, Mrs. Berelowitz said the findings showed, quote, the appalling reality of sexual violence committed by young people. The fact that some adults, usually men, rape and abuse children is generally accepted, she said. Generally accepted. There is, however, a long way to go before the appalling reality of sexual violence and exploitation committed by children and young people is believed. I believe it. We have found shocking and profoundly distressing evidence of sexual assault, including rape, being carried out by young people against other children and young people. Look at what these kids are being allowed to watch as far as TV shows, movies, books they've read, comic books they've looked at. The fact that parents will give their child, un- their child, their child, unfettered, unrestricted access to the vast world of anything goes pornography. And and give them the phone, give them the tablet, give them the laptop. They shut their door. You're pretending that nothing's going on. But it is. And maybe, maybe the reason why You're comfy with that is because you know that if you prohibited your child from accessing that stuff, well, that would kind of be like a double standard, wouldn't it? Where they can't do it, but you can. That's like going to them saying, now you listen here. If I ever, if I ever catch you smoking... I'm going to wear you out. You hear me, boy? I will not ever catch you smoking your cigarette. <sighs> Stay out of my liquor cabinet, too. Double standard. Great Britain, how did you get in that? How did you get in that situation? How did we, as America, get in that position? I'll show it to you. It's relatively simple. Nobody wants to believe it. It's relatively simple. Uh, Parents receiving threatening letters regarding mandatory medical slash dental exams for their kids. The government makes it clear who gets the final say in parenting decisions. This has been going on for years, too. Uh, We heard reports as far back as the 90s. I mean, I'm talking local here of the school district, health department, dragging girls in 6th, 7th, 8th grade into the nurse's office doing exams on them. Nobody knew about it. They said they were checking for warts. I don't think so. 
I don't think so. Police State USA has made been made aware of threatening letters being sent to parents by the government regarding their children's participation with compulsory medical and dental examinations under the auspices of keeping children healthy. See, here, here it is. This is about the welfare of the children. We know that some children aren't very well taken care of. So we, we feel sorry for them because we're very liberal and we want to help all the children. We've got to save the children. The children are at harm. They're at risk. And so we're going to save them. Back when I was, uh, this goes back to early 90s, I started doing research. Uh, this is really kind of what got me going, doing research into outcomes-based education and all of that stuff. And the state of Missouri has what's called a Parents as Teachers program. Actually, it's Teachers as Parents program. Parents as Teachers basically is a way that the health department and school district gets involved in, in every home and in every child, they, they're moving into the homes. The homes are not private anymore. They're not sacred. So they started analyzing these children, and they do these little questionnaires. Is your parent overweight? Does your parent smoke cigarettes? Are there visitors in your house quite frequently? They ask them these questions, and the idea is, is that if their parent is overweight or their parent smokes a cigarette, the child is at risk. He's in danger. He's going to die an early death if we don't jump in like Batman and save him. Under the auspices of keeping children healthy, the government has usurped the role of parent away from natural parents. The state, not legal guardians, is determining when and how children should be subjected to outside business influence. The first letter was sent to Police State USA by a parent in New York State requiring that his child be taken to mandated doctor visits as the letter states. Here's the letter. New York State Education Law, Section 136.3, requires students to get medical exams when they start school and at certain grades. Exams may also be needed at other times chosen by your school. To keep healthy, your child needs to complete a physical at least once a year and a dental exam every six months. In New York, after the unwanted examinations, the private medical exams are, re are acquired by the government and filed under child's cumulative school records. And here's what, the, here's what it says. This is the letter. Here's what it actually says. I'll read it to you. Please take your child to the dentist by December 31st, 2013. And then here's what it says. Decayed teeth are dangerous to your child's health. Dangerous. And can hurt his or her schoolwork. And it's a, it's a trap. It's a setup. It's a setup because see this is just let me let me let me let me explain it this way. There's a my wife keeps telling me that there's a law in the books in the state of Missouri recently passed. I know I never saw it, but she I believe her. But she keeps telling me if you're stay in the passing lane, Mike. They're going to pull you over and give you a ticket. Passing lane is for passing only, and you got to get over in the other lane. I like to drive in the passing lane sometimes because I get tired of having to pull over to pass people. And she's telling me, and I believe her, she's telling me that yeah, they said it on the news the other day that they're going to, they can write you a ticket for driving in the passing lane. And I'm going, unless they're following me for about 5, 10 miles, how in the world would they ever know that I was in the passing lane but wasn't passing somebody? How would they know that? I, I said, sweetie pie, I, I believe you. It's just that that one right there would be nearly impossible to enforce. But, you know, my suspicious mind says, I wonder why they have that law. It sounds like a good one, and I think the law is there to give a patrolman, a police officer, the right 
by law the right to pull you over and start the investigation. In other words, I don't personally I personally do not know of anybody in this area that was given a ticket for driving too long in the passing lane. Don't know of anybody. Never heard of it. Is it a law? Probably is. Why would it be there? That gives a cop. See, cops can't just pull up behind a car and go, I wonder if they got drugs in there. Let's pull them over and find out. Yeah, let's do that. They can't do that. If they see them breaking the law, uh, sir, you know why we pulled you over? Why? Because I got drugs? No, we saw you driving in the passing lane. Can I see your license registration? Is that alcohol I see? Can we check your car for drugs? Can we do that? Why can't we do that? Well, if we can't do that, then it just seems to us that you're hiding something, and so we're going to go get a court order. You wait right here. See how it works? This is one of those things where they're going to impose this mandatory get them to the doctor. And when you don't do that, because your trust of the whole medical field right now is about that big, especially now that the healthcare dictatorship has begun, you're just not all that up about taking your child to the doctor. Because the doctor has a right. In the state of Missouri, they're mandatory. Manda- Mandatory reporters, so am I. If I hear of something, I have to pick up the phone and go, uh, I heard this happen, you need to check it out, I'm a mandatory reporter. If if I hear of something related to a child and don't call it in, I get fined big time. I'm liable for it. Doctors, some doctors are pretty cool about it. Some doctors wearing these Superman outfits think that they are out to save America. They get these children in an exam room alone and start buzzing them with questions. When was the last time your mom or daddy hit you? When was the last time this? Have you ever seen a strange man come into your house? Have you ever done this? They got to pick up a phone. They call. They're going to rescue this child. I'm telling you, that's the kind of stuff that happens. It's a trap. It's just another reason. You didn't take your child to the dentist every six months? <sighs> Next thing you know, you're sitting in a county jail somewhere awaiting an arraignment. The guy sitting next to you, you find out he's molested 25 kids, and they ask you what you did. I didn't take mine to the dentist. <gasps> See what happens? Why are we this way? Why, how did we get this way? How did that happen? Um, I'll get to that in a second. I, uh, I got to show you this. Um, Pastor Mike, here's an image of the Tri-Catcher on the new show, Sleepy Hollow. I, I saw the previews of that show coming up, and I'm going, you know, maybe I ought to you know, look into that. I don't have time. Uh, so several of you out there are doing a good job. This show has tons of symbolism from the occult as well as Freemasonry. The premise of the show is a resurrected Ichabod crane uh, has been brought back to life in the present day to fight the evil headless horseman in our present time, who consequently is also portrayed as one of the four horsemen of the Alpacalypse. Oh, excuse me, Apocalypse. Sorry. Um, he is the... And I, I like it. I like... Uh, let's see, who is this? G.A. I don't know who that is. Um, I like how you did it. You, you learned, you picked up on it, you're going, there it is right there. Um, this headless horseman is the dying god whose skull has been separated and needs to be reunited with his body to unleash the other horsemen and as a consequence, the end times. There it is, right there. I, again, I'm going back through uh, the Man of Steel movie, and I, I, I'm i just stunned at the things that I missed because it is a two-hour advertisement for the Antichrist. 
You watch this movie and going, I hope Superman shows up one of these days. That would be like really cool. He could save the whole planet. That's what happens when you watch this kind of stuff. Same thing. Same idea. It's everywhere. Uh, so I, you know what? I appreciate you guys out there watching. I, I think it's awesome um, that people are out there watching, seeing what's going on, educating themselves, reading their Bibles, and they're going, this is that which was spoken of by the prophets. And I appreciate it. I really did. Because, again, I just don't have time to sit and watch all these programs. Um, I, just, I just don't have it. Um, got, to, got to study the scriptures. Got to keep my head in the Bible. Uh, where it belongs, and um, there are a couple things that catch my interest I look into and so on. Uh, but other than that, I just study the Scriptures, study the Scriptures, study the Scriptures. And um, I- anyway, but back to what we was talking about. How, how, did we get into, how did we get into this mess as a, as a nation? How did Great Britain get into it? And um, several years ago, Really, um, around 1990, when God called me into this ministry, 1997, of studying prophecy, um, I just, God, you just lead me. You show me where you want me to go. Show me what you want me to study. And, um, and God has done that. And, um, I, and I love it. I absolutely love it. And uh, I just started studying history a little bit. Not, you know, just, I, I, I know that sometimes history can be uh, misconstrued or you can make history say whatever you want it to say. History is subject to the historians and things like that. Um, and so I, I do kind of take this with a little bit of, little bit of salt and understand that there is one thing that is absolutely authoritative, and that is the Word of God. Uh, but when you look back and you see in history the hand of God, it is identifiable. You can, in fact, see it. You can see, when I look back on my life, I can see the hand of God. I can see the work of God. Um, I, I'll even say this. I believe God is a God of order. And God operates in a biblical, knowable fashion. According, you read the scriptures, you get, you know, you get used to how the Bible talks and you get used to the order and patterns of God. And you go, you know what? I can look at my life and I can see this is an order and this is an order and, and this happened to me this time. And so, and I believe in that. I sure do. The, the opposite of that would, is all the occult sciences and, and uh, geomancy and necromancy and numerology and all of this stuff. But I see an order in my life. I look back and I see the handiwork of God. I look at America. I look at Great Britain. You can even apply this in other nations and in other countries. Many, many nations where Christianity has been allowed to flourish and thrive, there is in many of them a is still a remnant of what was a godly heritage. Now, uh, Chris Pinto who I have met, um, I, we uh, were staying in a hotel together in uh, South Carolina. He kind of taught me a little bit about videography and things like that. He's a, he's a Hollywood-trained videographer. He's done some really good work. Um, uh, the Secrets in Stone series uh, that he did with Cutting Edge. Uh, he, he's, just a, he's done a lot of good research. He did... Um, uh, he just did a video here a while back, um, Secret History of America's Beginnings and things like that. I, I've watched it. Um, I, I can't cite that he's, and here's what he did. He does what I do. He doesn't take the conspiracy theories and say, look at that, look at that. He, he actually went into what came out of Thomas Jefferson's mouth, what he said, what he wrote on paper, and 
that's good. I mean, that's realistic. And and I I, I can't fault him in any way for what he did. Um, the idea, the, the question that people are asking, is America or was America ever really a Christian nation? Some would look at th- things that even I have talked about, like in Capital Secrets, the whole th- plan of Washington, D.C., was a cult from its inception. I believe that. It's, it's worse now. Um, was America ever a Christian nation? Because some will look at that and say, nope, it was all the Freemasons. They did it. They started the whole thing. That nation's never been good. It's never been right. We've been Mystery Babylon the whole time. And there is, you can see it forming throughout the history of America. You can see it. It's obvious. Was it ever, even before 1781, Constitution, 1776, the Declaration of Independence, was it even prior to that, before it became its own independent nation, was America ever right as far as what God was concerned, was America a Christian principled nation? And uh, and tomorrow is if you're living in some other country, you probably don't understand. I'm not uh, not tomorrow, but Thursday, we are going to celebrate a feast day. No, it's not in Leviticus. It's not Numbers. Not in Deuteronomy. It is a free will feast called Thanksgiving. And as many of you know the story about Thanksgiving. Um, And I'm going to get into that history of, of what happened and what these people said, what was on their minds when they migrated. Because before 1776, if you want to pin the, um, occult revolution, on that time, 1776, prior to 1776, and what, here's what most people are forgetting or leaving out of it. You had 150 years of the, the beginnings, the birthings, and the growth of America. And where did these people come from? They came from, primarily, they came from Europe. They left their homes, they got on a boat, they came over here to what they believed was no man's land. And I am, I am aware that there are some people out there may listen to this that are already um, scratching their fingernails on a chalkboard in disgust um, because I, I've read some posts by people that uh, talked about the, the Thanksgiving massacre of the Native Americans that were here at the time. Um, let me let me just address that. Number one, the real Bible Christians that came to this nation were not looking to massacre anybody. They were looking to have a place where they could build a church and a city where they could worship in freedom without the Church of England or the Church of Rome telling them, you can't do that. That's what they were looking for. They were followed, and there were those coming in at around the same time who were over here looking how to make a buck. Those were your exploiters. But that is not to be pinned on the Bible Christians who came over here who wanted to be able to have church and preach that book. You see what I'm getting at. And so I'm going to give you uh, I'm going to give you some history. And if your mind's already made up, ah, we were all Freemasons. Ah, they massacred everybody and that never was it. If you've already got your mind made up, then go uh Dr. Phil's going to be on a little bit. Go watch Dr. Phil. Go watch Dr. Oz or something, all right? Uh because I'm going to I'm going to talk about what I know. I'm going to talk about uh things that people said and I'm going to compare it with the Word of God. 
because you have to ask how did we how did we get how we are right now? So let's um, let's start with scripture. It's the best place I know of to go. Okay, let's start with scripture. Let's go to Isaiah fifty-five. The Bible says, "Behold, you know what? I gotta I gotta do this. Hang on here. Let me get that out of the way. There we go. Behold." Isaiah 55, 5, Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God, for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Then he says in verse 12, For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So here's what God said. God said there was going to come a time when he was going to call a nation, a people, that he knew not. This was not Israel. It was not the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was the Gentile nations. We know that. If you want to just continue that study you'll see it all through the scriptures it was the gentiles people from all from all tribes from all families he was going to call them to be a holy and a peculiar people so he said thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not now was that only the united states of america no i don't believe that but america at that time, we're talking 1620 on through the 1700s, 1800s, when, when people were coming here because they didn't want to be Catholic anymore or they didn't want to be under the thumb of the Vatican. They came over here to get away from them so they could worship the way God told them to worship and believe what God told them to believe according to the Word of God. That's what they were doing. They believed that they were called to do this because the Bible teaches us that God hath set us free and we're not to be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. And so they decided they wanted to shake off the yoke that was on them. I'm going to show you that. They wanted to shake off the yoke that was on them and come to a land where they could be free. And here's the interesting part. They saw Israel in the Old Testament as sort of a um, as sort of a, a light and a standard or they they saw themselves when they looked in a mirror they saw Israel is that biblical to do that well sure it is because Paul said all these things are are written aforetime for our learning they're written unto us as examples i personally can look at my life I can then go to the scriptures, I can go look in the Old Testament and see the types and the shadows and the events that took place, and I can see that's that's me right there. That's my life right there. I can do that, and if you're going to be honest, you can too. And when, when these people were coming over here, that's what they were doing. They were reading the scriptures, and they were going, that's what it, that's what it looks like we're doing. We, we see ourselves in the Bible because we want out of a land of bondage. And we want a land where we can worship God the way he tells us to worship him. Not the way the Vatican, not the way the, the, uh, the vicar, not the way the, the king or the queen tells us, but the way God tells us. That that's what they were doing. So they, they left the bondage. They left the Church of Rome. They departed from the Church of England. They, they escaped with their mortal lives from Bloody Mary, the Queen of the Scots. You know who she was? She was a Roman Catholic queen of England that was on a bloody, that's, why, that's where the term Bloody Mary comes from. She was on a rampage to kill and arrest the Puritans. Why? Because Il Papa told her to. The Jesuits said, kill them. We hate them. We don't want nothing to do with them. And so that's where they were under bondage. So in 1606, here is the famous 
or maybe for you, the infamous King James, this is what he said concerning the first charter of Virginia, 1606. We greatly commending and graciously accepting of their desires for the furtherance of so noble a work, which may by the providence of Almighty God hereafter tend to the glory of his divine majesty in propagating of Christian religion to such people as yet live in darkness and miserable ignorance of the true knowledge and worship of God and may in time bring the infidels and savages living in those parts to human civility and to a settled and quiet government. Did you see that? It was on the heart of King James of England not to go over and kill them. It's not what he said. Ah, if you see any, if you see them engines, why you just pop them? That's what you do. Right, we got to get rid of them. That's not what he said. You know what he said? Let's send some people over with some Bibles so that we can we can start preaching to them, start educating to them because they live in darkness. They worship. They worship the elements. Somebody sent me. Um, Pastor George Limelin, if you are listening to this, I got a document for you, buddy. Pastor George works up in in Minnesota with uh, the Ojibwa Indians. And uh, somebody sent me a PDF of, it was written by an Ojibwa, and it was about how all of their traditions center upon, here we go, earth, wind, fire, and water, the elementals. You see, how is it that the engines the Native Americans or First Peoples, how the First Nations, how did they have the exact same religion as the Sumerians and the Babylonians and the pagans and the Gothics and the Greeks and the Romans and everybody? How is it that they had the exact same religion as the Chinese and the Japanese? How is that? It's two religions in the world. There's Bible Christianity and then there is earth, wind, fire, and water, elemental witchcraft. And that's what Paul was talking about all through the book of Galatians. You can see it there. But King James was said, you know what, let's send some people over to build churches and have Bibles in their hand because these people are in darkness. Maybe, maybe we can reach them and bring them to civility. And when you listen to how First Nations people talk or uh, Native Americans, when you hear how they talk, they have been, their mind has been so turned against. And you know what? Yeah, yeah, there were some people didn't treat them very good. I get it. But there were some good people who had a good heart who wanted not to kill them, but to show them the gospel. Try to teach and preach Jesus Christ. And Pastor George is up there in Minnesota trying to do it right now. And he said, Mike, he said 350 years of tribal indoctrination plus the Roman Catholic Church has ruined these good people up here. He is in one of the hardest places in the world to preach the gospel. But let me go back to this statement because I bet you didn't know that. I bet you didn't know that what was on King James of England's heart was to send the gospel to a people who yet live in darkness and miserable ignorance of the true knowledge and worship of God. And may in time bring the infidels and savages living in those parts to human civility and to a settled and quiet government. I bet you didn't know that. That didn't sound very Freemasonic to me. Here's another one. 1608. These were the separatists. This is what the Puritans, the separatists, this was what was in their mind and why they wanted to come to this land. This is a quote. They shook off this yoke of anti-Christian bondage. And as the Lord's free people joined themselves by a covenant of the Lord into a church estate in the fellowship of the gospel, to walk in all his ways made known unto them. How is it made known unto them? They had a Bible. According to their best endeavors, whatsoever it should cost them, the Lord assisting them. So what was in their heart was not, ah, they got good plantation ground over there. They got good ground over there. We need to kill some Indians. That's not what was in their heart. What was in their heart is we have a Bible. It's telling us this is the way God wants us to walk. 
And the Church of England and the Church of Rome are killing us because that's what we want to do. And so we want to break the yoke of anti-Christianism, the Antichrist. We want to get away from the beast. And so we want to follow the Lord in a covenant that would be for our people, that God would be our God and we would be his people and we would establish a city or a township or whatever that is based upon biblical principles rather than what the Antichrist in Rome says for us to do. That's what they wanted. I, I, bet, you, uh, I bet you never heard that one before. Maybe you have. I don't know. So here we have one of their leaders, William Brewster, 1629. He said, the church that had been brought over the ocean now saw another church, the firstborn in America, holding the same faith in the same simplicity of self-government under Christ alone. Take a look at that statement. The church that had been brought over the ocean. You know who that was? Israel. Now we see another church, the firstborn in America, holding the same faith and the same simplicity of self-government under Christ alone. Pharaoh couldn't reach beyond the ocean, could he? The Red Sea. He couldn't reach beyond that, could he? And that's why God took him over there, out of Pharaoh's reach. Now he can't tell them what to do. He can't make them make bricks. By the way, I have a theory on that. It's pretty interesting. Anyway. And it does involve secret societies. But anyway, these Puritans, these separatists, this is what they saw. They went across the ocean where the kings and the queens and the, and the cardinals and the bishops couldn't get a hold of them and couldn't rule over them. And they said, you know what? We'll use the Bible and Christ as our king to rule ourselves. That's what we'll do. What a, do you know who came up with that? God did. Did you know that from the moment Israel left Egypt, they had no king up until Saul? How did they rule? You know what they did? They ruled themselves. First, it was Moses and, and the line of judges all the way through like uh, Samuel. He would have been the last. I think there's 17 of them, by the way. But then Moses gathered uh, the elders and the leaders of hundreds and the leaders of clans of 50 and things like that. And he said, here's the law. You, you judge. He didn't say enforce it. He didn't say send cops and military people out there with, with swords to kill it. It's not what he said. He said, you enforce these laws. Or excuse me, you judge on these laws. When cases are brought to you, you judge according to these laws. But it was done by familial heads. Self-rule. Self-government. You know what? The, the, there was no centralized, everybody do what Washington, D.C. does or says. They had the word of God to be their guide, and that's what these pilgrims were over here doing. They said, we're just going to... We're just going to do what the Bible said. Then in um, William Bradford, this is how he described their departure from Holland to America. He said, so being ready to depart, they had a day of solemn humiliation. Their pastor taking his text from Ezra 821, which says, and there at ye river by Ahava, I proclaimed a fast that we might humble ourselves before our God and seek of him a right way for us and for our children and for our substance. The rest of the time was spent in powering out prayers or pouring out prayers. That's how they spelled it back then. To the Lord with great fervency mixed with abundance of tears. So they left the goodly and pleasant city, which had been the resting place for nearly 12 years, but they knew that they were pilgrims, Hebrews 12. That was the actual quotation that Bradford used. We now as strangers and pilgrims is what the Bible says, but lift their eyes to the heavens, their dearest country, and quieted their spirits. They were following the scriptures. That's why they came over here, and they saw themselves. Ezra is the post-exile uh, book. Ezra is all about what they said 
and what they wanted to do after they came back from Babylonian captivity. They wanted to follow God, and so they started out with prayer and fasting. He then says, What could now sustain them but the Spirit of God and His grace? May not and ought not the children of these fathers rightly say, Listen to this now. Our fathers were Englishmen which came over this great ocean and were ready to perish in this wilderness. Deuteronomy 26, 5 and 7. But they cried unto the Lord, and he heard their voice and looked on their adversity. Let them therefore praise the Lord because he is good and his mercies endure forever. And he quotes Psalm 107, verses 1, 2, 4, 5, 8. Yea, let them which have been redeemed of the Lord show how he hath delivered them from the hand of the oppressor. When they wandered in the desert and wilderness out of the way and found no city to dwell in, both hungry and thirsty, their soul was overwhelmed in them. Let them confess before the Lord his loving kindness and his wonderful works before the sons of men. They saw themselves as Israel coming out of the wilderness, crossing the ocean into the land that God gave them. Now, here is the charter of the Plymouth Council. This is what established Plymouth Rock, 1620, by King James, in hope thereby to advance the enlargement of the Christian religion to the glory of God Almighty. Did you catch that? Again, 1620, King James is allowing these people, to go across the ocean to this land for one reason, to establish the enlargement of the Christian religion to the glory of God Almighty. That's what was in his heart. That's what he said. That's what he said was the reason why he was allowing them to go over there. Then, let's see here. Having been blown off course, this is a little bit of history here. Having been blown off course to Virginia, they landed at Cape Cod. See, they were headed for Virginia. But the wind caught them, blew them up toward Massachusetts. Uh, And the chowder is better up there, by the way. And they landed at Cape Cod, November 11, 1620. Little did they know that they had landed there a few, had they landed there a few years early, there would have been a massacre by the Patuxent Indians. The tribe, however, had been completely destroyed by a plague in 1617. Very, very interesting. Here is the Mayflower Compact. Have you ever heard of that? Before they ever, let me kind of let me explain this a little bit. When you are on a ship, you are governed by the laws and the rules of the ship. When you are on a ship, the captain is the authority on a ship. He rules that ship. If he says this is what you do, this is what you do. Before they decided to start bringing their families off of the ship, now out from under the captain's authority or the maritime authority, to land, now we gotta we got to have an authority here. They were not anarchist. They were not looking for, hey, I'm free. I'm going to take my clothes off and run around. That's not what they were wanting to do. They realized that before they before they landed and settled, They had to establish a doctrine of law. They had to establish how they were going to do it and what was going to be the final authority on everything. That was what the Mayflower Compact was all about. They realized, you know what? The king, yeah, yeah, he's king of England. We're over here. He can't tell us what to do. We are going to establish a free society, free from the Church of England, Church of Rome, from any of the European governments. But we have to have the rule of law. So here's what they said. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by ye grace of God and Great Britain and France and Ireland King, defender of the faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith. And honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one of and one of another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic. In other words, they are establishing a rule of law, a government. For our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, 
and by the virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In other words, we're going to do this God's way. So here, that established a precedent. So by the time, nine years later, 1629, you have the first charter of Massachusetts. Now we're going to establish a large land area as a colony. Here was what the charter said was the reason why they were establishing the colony of Massachusetts. And for as much, notice the date, 1629. As for, and, and for as much as the good and prosperous success of the plantation of the said parts of New England and for the directing, ruling, and disposing of all other matters and things, whereby our said people, inhabitants there, may be so religiously, peaceably, and civilly governed as their good life and orderly conversation may win and incite the natives of country to the knowledge and obedience of the only true God and Savior of mankind and the Christian faith, which is our royal intention, and the adventurer's free profession is the principal end of this plantation or colony. Did you see that? It was in their hearts to be evangelistic. They were following the code given to them by Christ in the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. That's the spirit that they had. So they come over here and they realize they're going to establish a community. They're going to establish a government. They're going to establish a, a state. And they said nothing should distract us from why we are here. There are people over here who have never heard the gospel. And we are establishing this land for one reason. Freedom to preach the gospel. That's why we're here. Let me show you another one. John Cotton, Puritan minister, most influential leader in the shaping of the future of New England. This is what he said. 1636, he based his code of laws on the scripture. Isaiah 33, 22, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Notice that you have the judicial, the Lord is our judge, you have the legislative, the Lord is our lawgiver, and you have the executive, the Lord is our king, he will save us. That is precisely what the American form of government is based upon. Isaiah 33, 22, this is why precisely why we don't and never did have a king it was we were not to have the the cry from uh the uh, the people of the day was no king save king jesus we don't want king george we don't want king henry we don't want king this and king that our king is to be king jesus and their laws were going to be based upon what they saw in the word of god now let me get my mouse here here we go here is a quote from John Cotton. Let all the world learn to give mortal men no greater power than they are content they shall use, for use it they will. And unless they be better taught of God, they will use it ever and anon. For whatever transcendent power is given will certainly overrun those that give it and those that receive it. There is a strain in a man's heart that will sometime or other run out to excess unless the Lord restrain it. But it is not good to venture it. It is necessary, therefore, that all power that is on earth be limited. Church, power, or other. It is counted a matter of danger to the state to limit prerogatives, but it is a further danger not to have them limited. They will be like a tempest. If they be not limited, a prince himself cannot tell where he will confine himself, nor can the people tell. It is therefore fit for every man to be studious of the bounds which the Lord hath set, and for the people, in whom fundamentally all power lies, to give as much power as God in his word gives to men. And it is meet that magistrates in the commonwealth, and so officers in churches, 
should desire to know the utmost bounds of their power, and it is safe for both. All entrenchment upon the bounds which God hath not given, they are not enlargements, but burdens and snares. They will certainly lead the spirit of a man out of his way sooner or later. It is wholesome and safe to be dealt with all as God deals with the vast sea. Hitherto shalt thou come, but there shall there shalt thou stay thy proud waves. And therefore, if they be but banks of simple sand, they will be good enough to check the vast roaring sea. Have you ever heard anybody in modern times talk that way? You know what he was saying? He is saying the Bible gives us the rules that God lays down for kings and for ecclesiastics both, church rulers, that their power is limited. But yet, they still have power. You have to ask yourself, do rulers, earthly rulers, do they have a tendency to go to excess in their ruling? The answer is yes. However, do the, the citizens, do they have it within their ability to go to the excess of lawlessness? And the answer is yes. There must be government. There must be a rule. There must be earthly institutions of governing bodies both in the country and in the church. I, as the pastor of Bethel Church, I have been granted authority by the word of God and by the laying on of hands of the presbytery, the elders, the overseers. But that power and authority is limited. I don't get to say, You're saved, you're not saved. I don't get to say that. I don't get to say, I will baptize you, I will not baptize you. And if I don't baptize you, you're not going to heaven. I don't get to say that. I don't. I don't get to tell people. I'm sorry, but I, that you know, you're you're planning on going vac- vacation to Florida. I'm going to veto that because I don't think that's a good place for you. You're going to marry this guy? You know what? I just don't think you ought to marry this guy. In fact, if you marry this guy, you're going to get kicked out of church. I don't. I don't have that authority. I don't have that power. My power as bishop must be limited. But there must be a governing power. And this is what John Cotton wrote. And you read this and you're going, that was the Spirit of God right there. I am neither a New World Order hack, but neither am I a libertarian nor an anarchist. A libertarian basically says, I don't want any government telling me what to do. An anarchist says, I'll do whatever I want to do. And to be honest with you, there are some people, maybe listening to me, that you're more on the anarchist side than you are anything. And I'm telling you, God designed for man to be governed. Limited, I will say, but governed nonetheless. It is the word of God. And God proscribes for us as citizens both of this country and citizens of heaven. He proscribes for us the respect for the ruling authority. Now, will the ruling authority exceed its bounds? The answer is yes. In such a case, I am not obligated to follow the earthly rule. Does that make it simple enough? Again, people just don't talk that way anymore. Havid University. Let me show you how they got started. Harvard University, one of the most liberal, godless institutions in the country. 1636. Let me show you how they got started. Let every this is the rules of conduct for students attending Havid. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. 
And there, John 17, 3, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And seeing the Lord only giveth wisdom, let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in secret to seek it of him, Proverbs 2, 3. Everyone shall so exercise himself in reading the scriptures twice a day that he shall be ready to give such an account of his proficiency therein, both in theoretical observations of language and logic and in practical and spiritual truth, as his tutor shall require according to his ability. Seeing the entrance of the word giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. Psalm 119, 130. See, they're quoting scripture. That they eschewing all profanation of God's name, attributes, word, and ordinances, and times of worship, do study with good conscience carefully to retain God and the love of his truth in their minds, else let them know that notwithstanding their learning, God may give them up to strong delusions and in the end to a reprobate mind. He was quoting prophecy. That's what the requirement was on the students of Harvard University, 1636. Look what we've done. Here's this gentleman, Increase Mather. He was the president of Harvard. He's pointing to a Bible, by the way, in this picture. When King Charles II demanded the return of the Charter of Massachusetts, Increase Mather prepared his response. In other words, King James gave the Charter of Massachusetts. King Charles was going to revoke it. Increase Mather said to submit and resign their charter would be inconsistent with the main end of their fathers coming to New England. Resistance would bring great suffering. In other words, we're going to fight it. Resistance would bring great sufferings, but better to suffer than sin. Let them trust in the God of their fathers, which is better than to put confidence in princes. And if they suffer because they dare not comply with the wills of men against the will of God, they suffer in a good cause. Wow. Wow. Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, January 14, 1639. The first constitution written in America, establishing a pattern which all others followed, including the United States Constitution. It was penned by Roger Wedlow, 1638, after hearing a sermon by Thomas Hooker, the Puritan minister who founded Hartford, Connecticut. So important was this work that Connecticut became known as the Constitution State. Here is what it said. The committee was responsible to frame the orders and was charged to make the laws, quote, as near the law of God as they can be, unquote. That's how the first Constitution of America was birthed. For as much, and here's what it said, for as much it has pleased the Almighty God by the wise disposition of his divine providence so to order and dispose of things that we the inhabitants and residents of Windsor, Hartford, and Weathersfield, and now cohabitating and dwelling in and upon the river Connecticut and the lands thereunto adjoining, and well knowing when a people are gathered together, the word of God requires that to maintain the peace and union of such people, there should be an orderly and decent government established according to God to order and dispose of the affairs of all the people at all seasons as occasion should require. Do therefore associate and conjoin ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth and do for ourselves and our successors and such as shall be adjoined to us at any time hereafter enter into the combination and confederation together. Here it is. Here's their purpose. Here's what Connecticut joined together for. To maintain and preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus, which now we profess, as also the discipline of the churches, which according to the truth of the said gospel is now practiced amongst us, as also in our civil affairs to be guided and governed according to such laws, rules, orders, and decrees. In other words, here's why we're gathering together, people. It's to promote the gospel and the liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's the oath of the governor. I, such and such, being now chosen to be governor within this jurisdiction for this, the year ensuing, and until a new be chosen, do swear by the great and dreadful name of the ever-living God to promote the public good and peace of the same, according to the best of my skill, as also will maintain all lawful privileges of this commonwealth, as also that all wholesome laws that are or should be made by lawful authority here established be duly executed and will further the execution of justice according to the rule of God's word. So help me God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you, can you imagine 
any body elected to public office today who would dare even invoke the word of God, much less the name of Jesus Christ. It is nearly unheard of in this country. But the fact of it is, that was how it was established. But that's not how we are now. And let's see here. Article 1. That the scriptures hold forth a perfect rule for the direction and government of all men and all duties which they were to perform to God and men, as well in families and commonwealths as in the matters of the church. Article 2. That is, in matters which concern the gathering and ordering of a church, so likewise in all public offices which concern civil order, as the choice of magistrates and officers making and repealing laws, dividing allotments of inheritance, and all things of like nature, they would be all be governed by those rules which the Scripture held forth to them. In other words, if you're going to have laws in here, they got to be by the Scripture, by the Word of God. Constitution of New England Confederation, 1643. Whereas we all came to these parts of America with the same end and aim, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel thereof with purities and peace and for preserving and propagating the truth and liberties of the gospel. That's why they came here. New Haven Colony Charter, 1644. The judicial laws of God as they were delivered by Moses are to be a rule to all the courts in this jurisdiction. 1644. Have you ever heard of the old deluder Satan law? You ever heard of it? You know what it is? It was the law in Massachusetts. Massachusetts, the most liberal. It's Barney Frank land. That's what it is. Massachusetts. They had a law called the Old Deluder Satan Law. It's what they called it. And it basically said, we have to make sure that public schools are established to teach little kids not how to read Harry Potter, how to read the scriptures. Way do you find out why they wanted kids to read the Bible. It being one chief project that out of that old deluder, Satan, to keep men from the knowledge of the Scriptures, as in former time, and that learning may not be buried in the grave of our forefathers in church and commonwealth, it is therefore ordered by this court that every township within this jurisdiction, after the Lord hath increased them to the number of 50 householders, shall forthwith appoint one within their town to teach all such children as shall resort to him to write and read. And it is further ordered that where any town shall increase to the number of 100 families or householders, they shall set up grammar school for the university. Did you catch that? Do you know why they, they said they wanted to establish schools? Because they said our enemy, the deluder Satan, when people don't know how to read the word of God, tyrannical governments will impose evil laws upon men. Men were designed to be free. God wanted men to be free. We must teach them the Word of God so that they can arm themselves with intelligence enough to know whether or not they're in bondage. Wow. We don't have laws like that anymore, do we? Maryland, the toleration. Let me stop right here. Maryland was one of the few colonies that was actually established by Roman Catholicism. Maryland. Okay? Um. But even in Maryland, 1649, they passed what was called the Toleration Act. And it basically said, if you run for public office in Maryland, you don't have to be Roman Catholic. We're going to allow you to be, you have to be Christian. You just don't have to be Catholic. Here's what it says. No person professing to believe in Jesus Christ shall be henceforth be troubled or molested on account of religion by themselves or indirectly to trouble, molest, or discountenance any person professing to believe in Jesus Christ for or in respect of religion, and if any such were so molested, to protect the person molested and punish the offender. Now, and basically they were saying, 
you have to prof- you if you profess to be uh, a, a believer in Jesus Christ, you don't have to be Catholic. And if anybody prohibits you from your duties or your assigned office or your election or whatever, because you're not Catholic, that person is going to be punished for it. Again, I, I just want to I just want to implore you. Yes. Secret societies moved in. Yes, any place where the Garden of Eden is, the serpent comes right in. I'm telling you, that's what happened in America. But to say that America was never a Christian nation, you have to prove it. And I'm showing you that there was a time period when America was overwhelmingly Christian, not just religious, Christian. Here's a man you may not have heard of, John Eliot, 1604 to 1690, a Puritan clergyman who was known as, quote, the apostle to the Indians, as he was the first to teach Christianity to the Indians of New England. Here's what he said, 1659. That which the Lord now called England to attend is not to search human polities and platforms of government contrived by the wisdom of man, but as the Lord hath carried on their works for them, so they ought to go unto the Lord and inquire at the word of his mouth. What platform of government he hath therein commanded? And humble themselves to embrace that as as the best. How mean soever it may seem to human wisdom. There is undoubtedly a form of civil government instituted by God himself in the Holy Scriptures, whereby any nation may enjoy all the ends and effects of government in the best manner. Were they but persuaded to make trial of it, we should derogate from the sufficiency and perfection of the Scriptures if we should deny it. The Scripture is able to thoroughly to furnish the man of God, whether magistrate in the commonwealth or elder in the church or any other, unto every good work. Written word of God is the perfect system or frame of laws to guide all the moral actions of man, either towards God or man. Laws built upon the Scriptures. Charter of Rhode Island, 1663, granted to Roger Williams, who established the first Baptist church in America. You know what he called it? First Baptist church. Here's what Roger Williams said, that they pursuing with peaceable and loyal minds, sober, serious, and religious intentions in the holy Christian faith, a most flourishing civil state may stand and best be maintained grounded upon gospel principles. You know, you know why these men kept saying the gospel, the gospel, the gospel? You know why they kept saying that? Because of what you see all throughout the Scriptures, what you see especially in the book of Galatians, where Paul said, Stand fast, therefore, um, in, the li- in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. These men, they were not dummies. They were not members of some secret organization. They were just men who believed the Bible who said, you know what, if we want to be free and stay free, the gospel must be preached. Ask yourself, what is happening to the gospel in this country right now? It's not being pre- It's not even being preached in churches. What's happening? We're about to be under a dictatorship in this country. That is, thus saith the Lord. Any time where the gospel, the real gospel, the one in the Bible, is not preached, evil men will take control over your body. Obamacare dictatorship is just around the corner, people. And if this country knew the gospel and knew that Christ died to make men free, both eternally and civilly here on this earth, we would have never allowed that to take over. The old deluder Satan, he came in and made everybody ignorant. Charter of Carolina, 1663, granted by King Charles II. 
quote, being executed with a laudable and pious zeal for the propagation of the Christian faith. And the enlargement of our empire and dominions have humbly besought leave of us by their industry and charge to transport and make an ample colony of our subjects, natives of our kingdom of England, and elsewhere within our dominions unto a certain country hereafter described in the parts of America not yet cultivated or planted and only inhabited by some barbarous people who have no knowledge of Almighty God. Furthermore, the patronage and advowance uh, ad- Avowance of all the churches and chapels, which as Christian religion shall increase within the country, isles, islets, and limits aforesaid, shall happen hereafter to be erected together with license and power to build and found churches, chapels, and oratories in convenient and fit places. We're going to preach the gospel, and we're going to build churches in Carolina. Peter Bulkley. Uh, 1583-1659, was the Puritan leader uh, who established the city of Concord, Massachusetts. In his only publication, The Gospel Covenant, or The Covenant of Grace Open, published in London, 1646, here's what Peter Bulkley said. We are as a city set upon a hill. Where did that come from? came from the gospel. In the open view of all the earth, we profess ourselves to be a people in covenant with God, and therefore the Lord our God will cry shame upon us if we walk contrary to the covenant which we have promised to walk in. If we open the mouths of men against our profession by reason of the scandalousness of our lives, we of all men shall have the greater sin. In other words, he said, America had a covenant with God. We go against that covenant, we're sinning. And he got that in Matthew 5, 14. You're a light of the world, a city that is set on a hill, cannot be hid. Here's the colonial legislature of the New York Colony, 1665. Whereas the public worship of God is much discredited for want of painful and able ministers to instruct the people in true religion, it is ordered that a church shall be built in each parish capable of holding 200 persons, that ministers of every church shall preach every Sunday and pray for the king, queen, duke of York, the royal family, and to marry persons after legal publication of license. Sunday is not to be profaned by traveling by labor or vicious persons, church wardens to report twice a year all misdemeanors such as swearing, profaneness, Sabbath-breaking, drunkenness, fornication, adultery, and all such abominable sins. That used to be the law of the land. Couldn't run a business on Sunday. William Phipps, governor of Massachusetts, I knew that if God had a people anywhere, it was here. And I resolve to rise or fall with them, neglecting very great advantages for my worldly interests, that I might come and enjoy the ordinances of the Lord Jesus here. That's Massachusetts, where Barney Frank lives. William Penn, 1682. He wrote in his book, Frame of Government, The origination and descent of all human power is from God. First, to terrify evildoers. Secondly, to cherish those who do well. Government seems to me to be a part of religion itself, a thing sacred in its institutions and ends. It is therefore enacted that all persons having children shall cause such to be instructed in reading and writing so that they may be able to read the scriptures and to write by the time they attain to age to 12 years of age. He got it. He knew what it was all about. It was about the gospels. It was about the scriptures. Charter of Privileges, 1701. All persons who also profess to believe in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, shall be capable to serve this government in any capacity, both legislatively or executively. Great Law of Pennsylvania, 1682. The first legislative act of Pennsylvania was, quote, there shall be established laws as shall best preserve true Christian and civil liberty in opposition to all unchristian, licentious, and unjust practices whereby God may have his due and Caesar his due and people their due from tyranny and oppression. John Locke, 1695. He is the guy that came up with the phrase life, liberty, and property. Here's what John Locke said. He that shall collect all the moral rules of the philosophers and compare them with those contained in the New Testament will find them to come short of the morality delivered by our Savior and taught by his disciples, a college made up of ignorant but inspired fishermen. Such a law of morality Jesus Christ has given in the New Testament. You know what? I got to stop right here. Here's what he was saying. Now, Thomas Jefferson 
was a learned philosopher. Thomas Jefferson no doubt studied the works of Plato and the Greeks and the mythologies and the paganism and everything like that, and Thomas Jefferson was not a Christian. No doubt in my mind about it. The men who came before Thomas Jefferson said, if you go study all these philosophies, Tom, and learn all these these worldly forms of government, you will never match the profound wisdom of 12 fishermen who were ignorant and unlearned but had been given the gospel of the New Testament. The government that derives from the Scriptures is far greater than what all the wisdom of the philosophers of the world can ever conceive and concoct. He was right. That was before Thomas Jefferson. Look what he said here. The Bible is one of the greatest blessings bestowed by God on the children of men. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture for its matter. It is all pure, all sincere, nothing too much, nothing wanting. And I'll say that by 1695, when he wrote this, it was the authorized Bible that had become the Bible of America. Now, when the Puritans came over in 1620, undoubtedly, many of them more than likely had a Geneva Bible. Here is one of the problems with the Geneva Bible, even though it was based upon the pure line of manuscripts. It leaned in its doctrines and statements. I'm talking about the Bible, the Geneva Bible. It added to the Word of God in one particular place, Ephesians chapter 6, where the King James says, where we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, the four kingdom. That's what the King James said. The Geneva Bible stuck a little phrase in there. They said against principalities, against powers, against earthly rulers. They added that. Why? Because the Puritans had been kicked in the rear end by earthly rulers, and they were ticked off at them, and they were mad, and they didn't like the idea of the divine right of kings. So they put a Bible, they, they wrote a Bible, the Geneva Bible, and they added that to it to make it sound like it was the Word of God. This is why I don't endorse the Geneva Bible. It had admixture of error in it. The King James, however, and this is what John Locke said, 1695, he said, this Bible is pure. It's nothing too much, nothing too wanting. It's absolutely right in everything that it says. You want some more? I've got more than what I've got time to give today. Here's the New Jersey colony. It being very necessary for the good and prosperity of this province that our principal care be in obedience to the laws of God to endeavor uh, as much as in us lieth the extirpation of all sorts of looseness and profanity and to unite in the fear and love of God and one another. Take due care that all laws made and provided for the suppression of vice and encouraging of religion and virtue, particularly the observance of the Lord's day, be duly put into execution. You, now, let's, let's apply this principle to right now. If America was still being governed under these principles, number one, there would be most, most television programs, songs, and advertisements would be illegal in this country. All pornography or even soft pornography would be banned and outlawed in this country. Can I get a second on that motion? All for it, people. I think it should be outlawed. I think pornography should be outlawed and banned in this country. Absolutely. There would, there would, you would see women dressing modestly, men likewise. You would never, never see two men kissing each other on the mouth in America. 
And everybody's trying to tell you, well, America is a free country. It was never designed to allow the freedom of immorality. Never. Wasn't there. Uh, let's see here. Colony of Georgia. Hey, you Georgia people, you got it right. Named in honor of King George was founded by James Edward Oglethorpe as a refuge for poor debtors from England and persecuted Protestants from Europe. The first settlers declared, quote, our end in leaving our native country is not to gain riches and honor, but singly this, to live wholly to the glory of God. Their object, quote, was to make Georgia a religious colony. I bet you didn't know that. I bet that's something that you didn't see in the conspiracy archives. Constitution of the State of Delaware, 1776. Every person shall be chosen a member of either house or appointed to any office or place of trust, shall make and subscribe the following declaration. In other words, you had to swear this before you took public office. I, Mike Hoggard, do profess faith in God the Father and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, and in the Holy Ghost. Boy, there goes all your oneness Pentecostals and Hebrew rootist. Do profess faith in God the Father and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, and in the Holy Ghost, one God, blessed forevermore. And I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures of the Old and Testaments to be given by divine inspiration. 1776, that was in the Constitution of the State of Delaware. John Winthrop. June of 1630, 10 years after the Pilgrims founded the Plymouth Colony, John Winthrop landed in Massachusetts with 700 people and 11 ships, thus beginning what was called the Great Migration, which lasted 16 years and saw more than 20,000 Puritans embark for New England. Here's what John Winthrop said. For the persons we are a company, professing ourselves fellow members of Christ, we ought to account ourselves knit together by this bond of love. For the work we have in hand, it is by a mutual consent through a special overruling providence. And more, and a more than an ordinary approbation of the churches of Christ to seek out a place of cohabitation and consortship under a due form of government, both civil and ecclesiastical. We're settling for God. Thus stands the cause between God and us. I want you to look at what he said. We are entered into covenant with him for this work. We have taken out a commission. The Lord hath given us leave to draw our own articles. If the Lord shall please to hear us and bring us in peace to the place we desire, then hath he ratified this covenant and sealed our commission. We'll expect a strict performance of the articles. The Lord will surely break out in wrath against us. Now, the only way to avoid this shipwreck and to provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. For this end, we must be knit together in this work as one man. We must hold a familiar commerce together in each other in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. We must delight in each other, make one another's condition our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in this work. As members of the same body, so shall we keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us when ten of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies, when he shall make us a praise and glory that men of succeeding plantations shall say, the Lord make it like that of New England. Look at, uh, he said, for you must consider that we shall be a city uh, as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken and so cause him to, to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword throughout the world. We shall open the mouths of enemies to speak evil of the ways of God and all professors for God's sake. We shall shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us till we be consumed out of the land whether we are Going. Can you can you identify the number of scriptures that he was invoking in this statement? It staggers the mind. This man knew the Bible. He knew the scriptures. And he said, we are like a city set on a hill. We come over here. God made, we are, we are in covenant with God. 
And if we fail in that endeavor, in that covenant with God as his people in this land, we'll be a, we'll be a, a proverb and a byword to people. You know where he got that from? Deuteronomy 29. You know where he got these principles? Deuteronomy 28. He said, if we'll live for God, we of, of five of us shall chase a thousand. If we don't live for God, five of them will chase a thousand of us. That's what he was saying. He was getting it from the scriptures. Um, I can go on and on and on with this. Joshua 23, 10, one man of you shall chase a thousand. That's where he was getting it from. He was getting it from the Holy Scriptures, people. And so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind this down. I want to see what some of you have to say. When, as I was studying this, 19, um, 1997, 1998 is when I really started looking into this. At the time, at the time, God had not as yet spoken his word gently to my heart in telling me, Mike, the King James Bible is the pure vine. It is the word of God. It is without error. After studying this, after seeing how the the providential hand of God was upon not just this little Mayflower boat in 1620. 20, 30,000, even thousands of people coming over from Europe for one reason. To live in a land that would be free. And they realized that that land must be maintained as free by one thing only, the gospel, the new covenant. Now, I want, you to, I want you to think along these terms. We have Israel, whom God, in the, with the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, we have them coming out of a land of bondage, crossing a sea, God giving them his covenant, his word. And that word ruled over them and judged them. But after a while, people stopped living by it. And I sat in my office one day and the Holy Ghost was, I was just going through these thoughts and I went, wait a minute. My forefathers were in a land of bondage. They came across the sea. God gave them the new covenant, his word. 1611, 1620. And they endeavored to live by the laws of the New Testament and rule over the people, both in their churches and in their their politics, according to the rules given to them by the Word of God. They They were under the covenant of Jesus Christ. And when I saw that, the light came on, and I went, this Bible is right. It's the Word of God. It is completely error-free, and at one time, it was the law of this land. So what happened? By the way, even after 1776, 1781, do you know what the first book that was ever ordered to be published with government money by the Congress of the United States of America? The King James Bible. Not the, not the uh, 
the Ahiman resin of Freemasonry. Not morals and dogma. The King James Bible, first book ordered to be published with government money in the United States of America was the King James Bible. This book, and England, you're the guys that came up with it. It's your Bible. It is to this day protected by the royal letters patent of the throne of England. Nobody but the monarchy can change what's in this book. It was your book first. What happened? Because now in Britain, as in America, we have kids molesting and raping kids. Why? No word. No covenant. No gospel. And you know what? Let's, let's look at it realistically. Those kids who turn out in that condition in the United States and England, let's be realistic. More than likely, those kids don't stand a chance in life. Not one. They are going to be in bondage to the perversions given to them by adults for the rest of their life. And many of you adults sitting out there, you're nodding your head going, that's right, they are. And you know why you know that. America was designed to be attached to its Bible. It is the foundation of what the people were supposed to be. It was to be governed and ruled by the Great Commission, by the the Golden Rule. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. And then... Love thy neighbor as thyself. So much so that they said laws that are generated in this colony must be in compliance with the scripture that says we must watch out for one another and care about one another. That, and and let, some of that is still a remnant or a fragment of that is still in place in America. But we can see it dying off and going away, can't we? Absolutely. I'm going to go over a little bit today, if that's okay with you. Good grief. Two-hour program. (sighs) Who'd have thought that wouldn't have been enough time? Eric likes it. He says, woo-hoo! Amen. Uh, Let's see here. I'm looking for something that is germane to what it is we're talking about today. Some of the other questions I don't mind dealing with, but I'll have to do it on another day. Um, Mike says, uh, Pastor, this is going to be a great video that we as followers of Jesus and lovers of this country can use when we come against those who will say that we are not a Christian nation. Thank you so much for this. I love how God keeps showing you just the right things to say. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. Alex. I wonder if that's Alex Jones. No, probably not. Pastor Mike, if every person in America was required to watch this video before Thanksgiving dinner 2013, we'd have a revival in this country. Alex, I I appreciate your sentiments. I actually think that it would be the word of God. The only thing that's going to bring about revival is the word of God. That's see, that's what revives us, isn't it? Okay. When you're, when you're not doing so well, what brings you out of it? got to turn my heating pad back up. It's the Word of God. Uh, But, Alex, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, eh, I'm going to give you an example of the kind of uh, opposition 
to what I just told you today. Jerry says, uh, hey, Pastor Mike, I'm not an Obama fan, but tell me what makes Obama worse than any president who had blacks as slaves and who killed Native Americans or ran them off their land. To me, that's worse than Obama. What's your point, and what does that have to do with anything that I just said today? What does that have to do with it? You want to blame the, you want to blame the presidents? Be my guest. Be my guest. But the real Bible Christians who came to this land didn't come to kill all them engines. They came to set them free. That's why they came. Uh, let's see here. Catherine says, great show, but I have to disagree on libertarianism. Libertarians are not anti-government, but are against a government that oversteps its bounds. I'll accept that. Within, I, I would have to study a little bit more about libertarianism. But true libertarianism would not recognize the bounds given in Scripture. Um, who is it? Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller. He's a noted libertarian in this country. He is an atheist. He would never accept the confines and the bounds of Bible doctrine and Bible rules to be the rule of law in America. He would never accept that. That is my major disagreement with libertarianism. Otherwise, I would be a libertarian. But libertarianism, from what I understand, would not recognize the bounds of Scripture. Because if you say that the government must be bound and have limits, that is a true statement. By what standard? If you don't bring the governor of the universe in and allow him to set the standard, then the standard just, again, is set by men who will then take it to extremes. That's what, how it happens in every civilization. So I appreciate you sharing that with me. Um, let's see here. William, hi, Pastor Michael. Love your show and love your teachings, but a pastor, but pastor, I'm a Democrat and stand strong with a lot of Democrat ways. I myself don't dislike President Obama or think he's as bad as you try to make him. I don't try to make him look bad. He does that on his own. Does it on his own. I don't think you are a racist at all, brother. Just think you have an agenda against Obama and Democrats. Fair enough. Uh, let's see here. Let da, 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 Uh, let's see here. Da, 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 sensationalism. Lisa. Let's see. Uh, my husband and I, and, well, I, let me shut the music off, okay? Um, I'm not just sidestepping some issues because I don't want to deal with it. Trust me, I do. I'm going to try to stick to what is germane to what we have talked about today, Okay. That's why I love your show. Thank you for your continued work. I'm using the King James Bible, but I know that you don't agree with the one published by Zondervan. Can you please explain why? And can you also recommend one that I could? We bought a, a shipment of Bibles from Zondervan to give away King James Bibles. Gary is the one who uh, brought this to my attention. I believe it's Hebrews 10. Uh, let me see here. Hebrews 10, 23. Let me put that on the screen here for everybody uh let's see here there we go um let me just check on this to make sure so get your bible look at it hebrews 10 blah 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 blah, blah. oh it can't be 10 23 can it um well maybe it can hang on here hebrews 10 let's see if it here, here we go let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering the Zondervan 
copies. Let us hold fast the profession of our hope without wavering. Uh, for he is faithful that promised. They altered the text of the, of the King James. I don't know if it's in any other um, places in the Zonovan printing, but it is there. And when I became aware of it, we sent them back and said, no, this, this, it's not the real King James. So that's, that's what we did. Uh, check your Bible to see if it's uh, going to hold true or not. Okay. Uh, Ananda, you've sent me uh, 12 emails so far. I wanted to know your thoughts on Focus on the Family and Adventure and Odyssey. They say it's Christian, but I have a feeling it's a setup. I think your feelings are right. I don't have all the information in front of me, um, so I can't say one thing or another. If Adventures and Odyssey, the Odyssey, of, I think it's based on the Odyssey of Homer, which is based upon Greek myth, or yeah, Greek myth. Uh, and it may be one of those deals where they're trying to show you a mythology to show you Christ. And Peter said, when we showed you the, the gospel, we didn't use cunningly devised fables. And so if that's the case, then I, yes, I would stand against that. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Todd says, uh, from your brother in the word, Todd. Hey, Todd, how you doing? Okay. Uh, here's our reality TV show star. I'm having a sick day today, and this is the first time I've been able to listen to your daily broadcast. Love you, man. Thanks. Come back see us sometime. We like to have a token California in our midst, all right? We can get you a pair of bib overalls to wear. Uh, let's see here. God bless you. This is from David. God bless you and your family in church. I thoroughly enjoy hearing you speak on the documents on which America was founded by the Puritans. In all of today's North America, the Native people, I believe, are now leaning back to their pagan roots. Um, I am in contact with some people, um, in, one in Canada that is uh, First Nations, and she sees it. She sees it. It's there. This is a backlash, of course, on the pagan Catholic Church and other churches which have fallen away. These same churches and, of course, the government are actively promoting this return to paganism. Of course we are because we, we had a barrier to paganism in this country, and it was called the King James Bible. And now that's been taken away. Uh, let's see here. Who else here? Joan, how sweet it is to hear the word of God from people who believe and didn't lie, and their work shall follow them in true ministers like you, Pastor Mike, a thousand things. I appreciate that. I'm just glad you didn't think you had to write a thank you a thousand times on here. But anyway, I get the idea of it. Appreciate that. Um... Pam, maybe both God's people and people under the spirit of Antichrist came over on the boats to America. I'm sure there were also the ones who had the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, I, Pam, I am not knocking, number one, anything that I've said in the past about Washington, D.C. and all the, the, the occult that you see there. Anything Chris Pino did, I think he did a fantastic job. What I'm saying to you is that to make this statement that we were never a Christian nation or a Christian people, and that we were, this was all the well-crafted plot of all the secret societies in the Illuminati back in the, uh, back in the 1500s, 1400s, to say that, to say that Francis Bacon is the one who built America, to say that is incorrect. Because before these subtle things began to take root in this country, you had men that came over here that loved the Word of God and wanted them and their posterity to live by it. So I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, let's see here. Hey, Pastor, we, now we have America's cities installing tracking and spying devices to observe and control their population. This is germane to what we've been saying because th what, what was going on was these people came over because the Church of England and the Church of uh, and the Church of Rome had these people scrutinizing them, spying on them. The gunpowder plot. You ever hear of that? It was the Vatican sending Jesuits over to England to destroy the work of the translation of the King James Bible. 
It was a conspiracy. The Vatican had spies in England watching them. And you quote here um, Jeremiah 5, 6, uh, a leopard shall watch over their cities. That's the Antichrist. And what do we have now, people? We have the leopard, the spirit of Antichrist, watching over everything that we say and do, including this broadcast today. Because what I'm preaching to you is dangerous to the new world order. Because I'm preaching to you that at one time, people came to this country out of the sight and oversight of all the dominions and principalities in Europe so they could live free. And then they established the gospel as the rule, and they said, as long as we live by the gospel, we won't need an abundance of laws. We won't need an oversight watching everything that we do. We won't need that because God himself will rule over us and correct us when we're wrong. But now we've told God, stay out of America. And in that case, God has allowed the leopard to watch over our cities, listen to our cell phone calls, read our text messages, Everything that we do, including reading our face. It's as simple as that. Good observation. Joan says, I have a Bible entered according to Act of Congress by A.J. Holman and Company in the year 1873 in the office of the Librarian of Congress, Washington, D.C. On September 27, 1876, it has a judge's report in which the KJB received the Centennial Award Medal, the highest prize Diploma of Merit Medal of Honor awarded by the United States Centennial Commission. Ooh, you better hang on to that one. I'd like to see a picture of it if you can, all right? Um... Karen says you hit the nail on the head with the standards comment. Right arm, Pastor. Right arm. Let's see here. Joyce, we have not lived the scripture, and that is the problem of the folks of our great nation. Amen. Jeremy says, wow, this has been a history lesson extraordinaire. Would love a copy of today's show to show friends and family. I went to public school and was aware even back then that we were learning watered-down history. I just got a pocket constitution in the mail. You're a terrorist. You are a right-arm extremist, fundamentalist, and you carry a constitution in one hip and a pistol in the other. You are a terrorist and a threat to the homeland insecurity of America. It's just what they say. I just got a pocket constitution in the mail for free. If you'll send them a self-addressed stand envelope, they'll send you one, and he gives the address. Can't wait. You can look it up online. Can't wait till the watch pack comes in the mail. God bless you, Pastor Mike. I appreciate that. Folks, I love it. You know what? If you started, you Aussies, if you started looking into Australia history, you'll find something very similar. In the Netherlands, where did the, when the Puritans got chased out of England, where did they go? Holland. They went to Holland because the Hollanders, or is it the Hollandaise? Anyway, the, the Dutch, you know, that's always confused me. It's called the Netherlands, but they live in Holland, and they're called the Dutch. A- anyway, the, the Dutch let them worship how they wanted to. You could probably find roots of Bible Christianity and good men in a lot of nations. The problem is... We threw our Bibles in the trash. Now it means nothing anymore. And the leopard is on his way, everybody. So, if we lose this nation, I just thank God that I've got a better one waiting. All right? I've got a better one waiting. I don't want to lose this one. But if I do, 
I have a far better place to go to. And I hope you do too. Get your Bibles out and read them. Be a good American. It's Pastor Mike. We'll see you later. Bye.